Hi, my name is Nikki Cooley and today I'm going to talk to you about solute transport in plants, lecture 5. This is part of the plant physiology subject which is offered in both the agricultural and video cultural degrees at NMIT. The aim of these lectures is for you to understand the importance of solute transport in plants, the process of solute transport and it's important for agriculture. We're going to define solute transport and present an overview. Hopefully by the end of this lecture you will understand the difference between whole plant trans transport and local transport. You will understand about the, both the passive and the active transport mechanisms, the very important role of membranes in transport and I will introduce to you the three transport mechanisms which are used in plants. So we're going to define <coughs> the solute transport as the movement of solutes from one location to another within the plant. Importantly, transport can occur on two scales. There is the local scale, which is where transport occurs across short distances, and this tends to be regulated by membranes. Then there is the larger scales, and this allows uh, solutes to be transported throughout the whole plant system. And this is controlled by membranes. When solutes are transported throughout the whole plant, this tends to occur through the vascular system, which comprises of both the xylem and the phloem structures. Transport of solutes is dependent on both the chemical composition of the solute and the physical process within the plant. The most common form of trans transported solutes in a plant is in the ionic form. In this image we can see an overview of how solutes move throughout the whole plant. So this is the large scale of, of solute movements across the plant. Solutes and water are found in the soil solution. They can enter the root hair via the epidermis. Once they're in the epidermis they can be transported through to the root cortex and once they go through the root cortex they then enter the root xylem. The root xylem enables transport of these solutes and minerals all the way through the plant. Transpiration is the loss of water from the leaves when the stomat, stomata are open. When these stomata are open, CO2 can enter the plant. If all conditions are uh, appropriate, CO2 can be fixed into sugars via the process of photosynthesis in the leaves. <coughs> Once sugar is um, fixed, it can be then translocated through the phloem and delivered into storage spaces. This can be in fruit or it can be um, in the root or the stem or the trunks. Importantly, oxygen is taken into the plant via the roots and there is some CO2 loss. So this is the whole transport of solutes through the plant. In the next few slides we're going to concentrate specifically on the water and mineral uptake at the root tips. So when stomata are open the plant is transpiring. Solutes move from the soil into the root. Solutes are transported into the centre of the root called the style, where they reach the vascular bundle and enter either the phloem or xylem depending on the physical chemical properties of that solute. The Casparian strip is a cell wall outside the steel but within the root and this is a pretty amazing evolutionary trait as it prevents the loss of solutes from the root. This process results in the roots being under tension and water potential plays a key role in plant solute uptake. Here we have an image of a root structure. From this root structure you will be able to observe the, the xylem, the phloem, the endodermis, the cortex which is the area between the endodermis and the epidermis. In figure B you can see how the capsicum strip is located in the endodermis and this prevents molecules going back out of the root. Water will only enter the root at the root tip or the root tip hair tip. <coughs> the structure and the architecture of the root can alter the rate of solute uptake. 
In the practical, we are going to look at the architecture and compare monocots and dicots. And later on in this lecture, we will look at this in a bit more detail. So water potential plays a key role in solute uptake. Root hairs increase the surface area of the root, and they also increase the surface area of osmosis. If the water potential is more negative within the plant than the surrounding cells, the nutrients will move from a high solute soil concentration to a lower concentration in the plant. It is important that you understand the concepts of water potential, and if you need more assistance on this concept, you can look to the tutorials for that assistance. There are three physical processes of which solute transport can occur. There is simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion and active diffusion. And we're now going to spend a little bit of time trying to understand these. So simple diffusion, also referred to as passive uh, transport, can be thought of as a spontaneous downhill movement of molecules. That is, the molecules follow a concentration gradient. They move passively through the bio lipid bio bio layer membrane and no transport proteins are involved in passive transport. Here we have a high concentration of solutes in the extracellular space above the cell. Within the cell there is a low concentration of these solutes. Passive transport, transport or simple diffusion occurs. The molecules move through the bilipid bilayer membrane into the cell. As this process continues, the concentration in the intracellular space increases while the extracellular space decreases. At a point, they will reach e equilibrium, that is the same concentration outside the cell as inside the cell. And at this point, passive transport using or employing the simple diffusion ceases. In summary, solutes can can are diffused from a high concentration to a low concentration. This is summarised in Fr Flick's first law. The movement of molecules by diffusion always proceeds down a gradient of free energy or chemical potential until that equi equilibrium is reached. A type of uh, simple diffusion is called osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules across a selectively permeable membrane. The net movement of, of water molecules through a partially permeable membrane from a solution of high water potential to an area of low water potential. I'd like you now to please watch the following video on the web link. This will give you a visual picture of how water molecules can move into plants. Now we're going to talk about facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is the rapid movement of solutes or ions following a concentration gradient which is facilitated by transport proteins. Here we have a visual representation. This is the extracellular space where the solutes are accumulating. These solutes will be transported through the protein into the intracellular space. These proteins are called carrier proteins and are very sophisticated, as can be seen by the illustration here. This, this requires energy in order to move solutes through these proteins. The loss of hydrogen, ions to the soil, and as you can see these are very complex mechanisms we're describing. You can refer to chapter 6 in the textbook Plant Physiology for more details on this process. This brings us to our final mechanism, active transport. Active transport is the movement of substances against a, a gradient of chemical potential or uphill movement. Where the chemical potential of any solute is defined as the sum of the concentration, electric and hydrostatic potential. Direct use of energy to transport molecules across the membrane. Here we have an illustration of a plant extra and intracellular spaces. Here we have specific proteins which enable the active transport. The particular proteins that we're seeing here are using the energy in the form of ATP. 
this is converted into ADP. The things that you will note most importantly is that it is going against a concentration gradient. Therefore, it's not favourable to allow passive or facilitated diffusion to occur. Most of the enzymes that perform this type of transport are referred to as the transmembrane ATPases. Sodium potassium pump is used by the ATPases enzymes and they are enable to maintain cell water potential. There are several forms of energy. There is redox or photon light energy which may be used in active transport systems and this just depends on the system and the protein. In this illustration of active transport, potassium ions accumulated passively. Active uptake when external potassium ions is low. Sodium is actively pumped out of the cytosol into the extracellular space and the vacuole. Excess protons actively pumped from the cytosol. Anions actively taken up into the cytosol and calcium activity transport is transported out of the cytoplasm. Solute chemical composition. As we stated earlier on in the lecture, the chemical potential is an important requirement for how solutes can be translocated through the plant. If a solute carries an electrical charge, for example potassium ions, the electrical component of the chemical potential must be considered. This calculation here defines the electric chemical potential. It is not essential for you to learn this chemical, this uh, formula, but if you require more details you can refer to chapter 6 in the text. The electrochemical potential will indicate the driving force and the direction of the potassium ion diffusion across the membrane. Ions diffuse in response of both their concentration gradients and any electrical potential differences between the two compartments. Importantly, you should remember that the ions can be driven passively against their concentration gradients if an appropriate voltage is applied between two compartments. Membrane potential implies an uneven, uneven distribution of charge. However, the actual number of unbalanced ions is, is quite negligible. For example, a membrane protein of minus 100 millivolts, which is common in most plant cells, results from the presence of one extra anion out of every 100,000. This gives you a concentration difference of only 0.001% extra anions found immediately adjacent to the membrane, no membrane charge imbalance in the bulk of the cell. So it's only around the membrane, not the whole cell. The cell walls and the cytoplasm are continuous from cell to cell in most plant tissues. The cytoplasmic continuum is called the symplast and the cell wall continuum is called the apoplast. So far we've described what's called the transmembrane route, that is when transport occurs out of one cell, across a cell wall and into another cell. There are two other transport routes, the symplast route and the apoplast route. Here we have an illustration of these three processes. The transmembrane route we have described out of one cell through a membrane across to another membrane into the next uh, cell. This is the symplastic route and this is the apoplastic route. So let's uh, learn a little bit about the symplast route. It is the most common route used in plants. Transport occurs through the cytoplasm. Water enters the root hair cells across the partially permeable membrane by the process of osmosis. Water moves from high water potential in the soil to lower water potential in the cell. Water moves across the route from cytoplasm to cytoplasm and down the water potential gradient. It passes from one cell to the other cell via the plasma, plasma desmata. Water moves into the xylem via osmosis. The only way across the endodermis. Normally the most important pathway in plants. The apoplast route, this is where water moves through the cellular cell wall 
and intracellular spaces. The permeable fi fibres of cellulose do not resist water flow. Therefore, water cannot pass the endodermis by this route. Because the capsparian strip in the endodermis cell wall is impermeable to water. Due to the waterproof band of serberin, which is the protein that enables this process. So all water molecules pass the endodermis via the cytoplasm. Therefore, it is under cellular control. Apoplast route is important when transpiration rates are very high as it is faster and requires no energy. Water potential is very important in the process of plant water status and in the process of solute transport. To survive, plants must balance both water uptake and loss. Osmosis is the passive transport of water across a membrane and water potential is a measurement that combines the effects of the solute concentration and physical pressure due to the presence of the plant cell wall and then determines the direction of movement of water. Water flows from regions of high water potential to regions of low water potential. If you are still having trouble with water potential, then please ask some questions at the tutorial. Also, I have added some additional information of the resources that you may find helpful to explain this. Let us talk now about the lateral transport of minerals and water, specifically in the root. So uptake of soil solution by the hydrophilic walls of root hairs provide, provides access to the apoplast pathway. Water and minerals can then soak into the cortex along this matrix of cell walls. So this is the apoplast root described. Minerals and water that cross the plasma membrane of root hairs enter the symplastic root which is shown in blue here. As the air sol solution moves along the apoplast, some water and minerals are transported into the propoplast of cells of the epidermis and the cortex and then move inward via the symplast. <coughs> Regardless of which route water and minerals enter the root, they end up in the vessel xylems where they can be translocated to the rest of the cell. In order for plants to uptake nutrients, it is often important for them to have an association with bacteria. Most bacteria form what we call mutually beneficial relationships or symbiotes. And these can be with fungi or microbes and they facilitate the absorption of water and minerals from the soil. In return they will obtain something from the plant such as sugars. Roots and fungi form microzobi, symbiotic structures consisting of plant roots united with fungal hyphae and here we have an image of such a symbiotic relationship. I cannot describe the importance of these relationships for healthy plants to uptake nutrients and water. Flow and loading. Sugars from mesophyll leaf cells must be loaded into the sieve tube membranes before being exported to sinks. Depending on the species, sugar moves by the symplastic and apoplastic pathways as previously discussed. In many plants, flow and loading requires active transport. This is because you're going against concentration gradients. So protein pumping and co-transport of sucrose and hydrogen ions enable the cells to accumulate sucrose. So simply sucrose is pumped via the protein from the extracellular into the intracellular, the flow structure. Hydrogen ions are pumped through the proteins with expending energy in the form of ATP which is then converted into ADP. Stomata are the organs found on leaf surfaces. They allow CO2 to enter the plant and lose water which is described as the transpirational compromise. Here you can see the structure of the stomata illustrated. It contains two guard cells of which there are vacuoles inside the guard cells. When the stomata is open, 
the movement of gases and water can occur and when it's closed no movement of gases will occur. <clears throat> In order for the stomata or guard cells to open they have to be turgid that is water is actively pumped into the cell. This pumping or occurs via the transport of potassium ions which can be shown in this image as red dots. So the concentration of ions across the plasma membrane which is this section here and the vacuole membrane causes turga changes of the guard cells which results in the cell either being open or closed. Many of you may see small droplets of water on the end of the leaves. This is quite common, say, in grapevine leaves. This is caused by the process of gatation, which is caused by root pressure. Water droplets are excluded out of the leaf tips by when the leaves are transpired and excess, excess force of the leaf. For more details, uh, refer to this link if you're interested. Turgidity. If the same flaccid cell is placed in a solution with a lower solute concentration, it's hypertonic. The cell will gain water and become turgid. Healthy plant cells are turgid most of the time. This is a simple concept which helps you understand both the opening and closing of stomata and also plant water relations within a plant. When understanding water and solute movement throughout a plant, it is important to realize that this is driven by the transpirational pull. That is, when the stomata open, the differences in water potential occur, causing a water potential gradient which um, forces the water through the plant. It is important to realize that there are cohesion and adhesion properties of water which facilitate this movement through the plant. Here is an illustration of how water is moved through the plants from the cell describing um, the different types of transport we have discussed previously through the xylem and up through into the leaves where it is transpired. I like this image as it gives a nice overview for the water movement and brings together the many processes we have been describing in this lecture. I hope that you have learnt from this lecture that the solute transport in plants is indeed complex and very specialised, that there are a number of mechanisms and they can, once you understand these mechanisms, mechanisms you can begin to inform growers and far farmers of the importance of the control of water and nutrients in plants. Three transport mechanisms are used in plants. I'd like you to learn about these three transports. I'd like you to learn about the differences and similarities between passive and active transports, particularly their energy requirements. Please refer to the additional um, readings and papers that will be located on Moodle for you to look at. Thank you for your time.